So we're here in front of uh, the Kodiak 900. The Kodiak 900 uh, debuted at Oshkosh 2022. Uh, we received FAA certification for the plane uh, in July of 2022. So here's the second one we built. This was our one of our experimental uh, test beds. Um, and this has basically, this is conforming to how the first airplanes will be with some minor uh, tweaks and changes, but this is 98% how they'll be when customers start getting deliveries. So the biggest changes overall with the Kodiak 900 as compared to the Kodiak 100 is firewall forward is all brand new. So it's a Dash 140A, which is a 900 horsepower PT6. Of course, everything attached to the engine, the propeller, the cowlings and everything was is also all brand new. The fuselage was stretched about four feet. And interior wise, you get, I think the 3.7 or something around those figures, uh, interior, extra interior space. But the wing, the tail cone, tail feathers, empennage is all identical between the Kodiak 100 and the Kodiak 900. Uh, you'll notice this has flap track fairings. Those are just uh, composite bolt-ons, but in structure-wise, the wing is identical between both airplanes. So there's a lot similar, but there's also a lot that's very different. So kind of starting from the front to the back, and I'll probably forget quite a few things because there's so much that's changed, but we already talked about the engine. It's 900 horsepower continuous. So the Kodiak 100 was 750 in takeoff, 700 in cruise. This is 900 takeoff, 900 cruise. Um, we have a five-bladed Hartzell composite prop. Max RPM on this airplane is 1900. So from a noise uh, footprint standpoint, this is actually a bit quieter outside than the Kodiak 100 was or is. Um, of course, uh, you, you, it's easy to see just how different the cowling looks between both airplanes. Um, basically firewall forward, this is all brand new. The cargo pod is an integrated feature of the plane now. So the Kodiak 900, um, the cargo pod is part of the plane. It's not an option. You can't get the airplane without it. It's part of the plane. What that allowed us to do was basically make this entire firewall and it, it we we designed the plane with the cargo pod in mind as opposed to the cargo pod being an afterthought um, and that's one of the big areas we get a lot of the speed from uh, so the other area that was completely redesigned is airflow intake and airflow exit so um, a lot of people don't realize that when a you know the air coming into the various inlets, the engine inlet, the oil coolers, things like that. You take this big thing of air and then you have to neck it down and that creates a lot of drag and then how it flows through the engine and various compartments and then comes back out. When it comes back out through ports like this and like this, it could be turbulent or create turbulence, which also adds drag. So our engineers spent uh, re you know years refining this, refining these shapes to make sure that the airflow going into the engine and coming out from the engine was as aerodynamic as possible. So that's another area we got a lot of speed improvements. Um, opening the engine cowling here, as I've stated, really everything up front here is completely different from not just the engine, but kind of everything attached to the engine. So we have um, new accessories. We have a 300 amp starter generator. We have a bigger alternator for standby generation. Every airplane comes standard with air conditioning. Uh, one thing I'll talk about in a minute is the electrical system and the environmental system probably took one of the biggest redesigns. Electrical is all brand new. Environmentals is quite a bit new. Um, so this is our AC compressor. One thing you'll notice if you're familiar with the Kodiak 100 compartment is there's no batteries in here. Kodiak 100 has a two battery system in front of the firewall. In this airplane for um, various reasons, particularly um, EASA, some EASA requirements, 
but also for some uh, for various operations and reliability reasons and fleet operations and just um, ease of maintenance. We went to a one battery system and it's between, when we step inside, you'll see there's a smallest center console. The one battery is between the two crew seats. The beauty with that is there's a quick disconnect. You can easily take the battery, you know, quick, quickly disconnect it or even take it out of the plane. So if you're in a really cold environment, a lot of operators up north uh, or way down south will actually bring the batteries inside overnight so they don't sit out in the, in the you know, super cold temperatures. So that's something that is easy to do with this airplane. In talking about all the various you know, engine compartments and redesigns, another big thing that we took to heart is ease of maintenance and maintainability. This airplane, we believe, will do really well with fleet operators as well as special missions operators. And through the Kodiak 100, we've learned that airplane is really easy to operate, easy to maintain. Uh, but having that been around for 15 plus years, we've learned a lot and there's always room for improvement. And so we took what was already really easy to maintain and we made it even easier to maintain. Of course, the 140 has a sight gauge, which is nice. Some other PT6s have that as well, but that's a new feature from the Kodiak 100. And for the most part, those are the, those are the high level items. Oh, before I forget, TKS system. So this is of course a Fiki airplane. One of the things that we totally redesigned was the TKS system. So the, like I mentioned earlier, the control surfaces, wings, tail feathers all stayed the same. So the way the TKS is put on those and works on the wings is all the same. But the everything besides that has been redesigned. Um, so again, going back to the maintain maintainability, ease of maintenance on the plane, in the forward cargo compartment here, if I remove a few of these things, you can see behind here is where the TKS um, tank is housed. It's a little bit bigger, it's 20 gallons. And the nice thing with that is if we removed that barrier, you would see that the TKS um, tank has everything with the TKS system as a part of that tank. So the pumps, the backup pumps, everything is housed in that one area. And it's actually really quite simple to unbolt that and it comes right out of here. So when you have to go through that for annual, you no longer have to drop the cargo pod and do a bunch of rigmarole like some airplanes you, you, have, you have to do. You can easily just unbolt that, take it right out of the cargo pod opening and it's all housed in that one area. It's not standard. It's one of the very few options that we have um, because again, our mid-latitude customers, Latin America, Africa, Middle East, parts of Southeast Asia, they have no need for TKS and TKS does weigh, you know, it's, it's not insignificant, you know, it's basically a person. So if you wanna maximize your payload and you have no need to fly IFR or you're just not in, a, in an area where you need TKS, you can get this without the TKS system. But pretty much that, that and the interior and the weather radar are really your only options on this plane. Pretty much everything else is standard. The other thing that we did with the TKS is, um, you know, as a pilot myself that's filled m many of TKS tanks, you know, it's, I love it when I'm in the air because in my opinion, it's, it's the safest anti-ice system and a turboprop. Of course, we don't have the bleed air like jets have, but I, I really prefer TKS over boots, especially in an unpressurized airplane. But on the ground, the glycol is quite messy um, and pouring it in, funneling it in to all airplanes with TK, you know, with TKS is kind of a pain. So we redesigned it. And what we did is we made this box here and all you do, every airplane comes with a hose. Uh, I have it right here, but all you do is you push that hose right in here. It's long, it goes all the way to the ground. And if you have a 55 gallon drum or you have a 2.5 gallon TKS canister, however you have your TKS, you just push one end here, put the other end in the bucket flip this switch and it fills it from, you know, from empty to 20 gallons. It's all automatic. So when you open the box, you can tell, okay, my green light is on, it's full. Um, if I, if the green light is not on, it's not full. Do I have minimum dispatch? In other words, can I take off and do I have enough 
to legally take off an icing, that's the yellow. And uh, the red is just showing that I have power to this panel. This is a hot bus, so it's on without the, without the avionics on. And then as soon as I close that, it goes off. Even when it's full, it auto shuts off. So you can theoretically, like your car, you can walk inside, do whatever, come back out, it'll auto shut off. Moving back, um, as we already mentioned, the cargo pod is, is different. It's integral to the plane. So in order, by making it integral, by making every airplane with a, with a cargo pod, it allowed us to open a lot of different design elements that we otherwise didn't have with the Kodiak 100. So we made it a lot more aerodynamically efficient. You know, 210 knots and an airplane like this is quite substantial. Uh, it's 30 to 35 knots faster than a Kodiak 100. A few of the other things that we were able to do, the cargo pod latches themselves again for aerodynamics. We made the latches so they're flush. Every cargo pod now has locks on every door. Again, that's all standard. The other thing too that you'll notice is we still have 65 pounds per square foot. A lot of composite material, you can't put real heavy dense items on it because it just doesn't have the strength or rigidity. So this pod, you can still, you know, still has that 65 pounds per square foot. So you can put heavy dense items in there. Um, the pod volume is very similar to a Kodiak 100. It's changed in shape. We've had to kind of make it a little bit more aerodynamic. So we lost a little bit of volume in that range, but we gained more. So in all in all, it's about a wash, but you can still put a ton of stuff in there. My personal favorite feature as a snow sports and fishing and a lot of different activities that I like to do, you can see in here, uh, and I'll open the bottom hatch here in a second, but the cargo pod now has a pass through between base two and three. And that allows you to put long items like skis or surfboards or snowboards or fishing poles or lumber or, you know, whatever, whatever you couldn't fit in a cargo pod of the past, you kind of can now. And we've also added a fourth door. So now you can really easily put long things straight in. And uh, so you still have the, this door but you can put long things straight in so you don't have to do the dance of trying to work angles and everything else. And you can still, this door has high level strength, so it's still rigid. So you can still put heavy things on this door, you know, in flight. So it's not gonna, it's not gonna pop open in flight or something like that. So that's the cargo pod. Um, I guess probably the most noticeable thing from the people from the outside looking in is these wheel fairings. Some people call them wheel pants. They're on all three wheels. This is another area where, believe it or not, we got, we got quite a bit of speed out of these. Um, so these are, you know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Um, I, uh, at first, frankly, wasn't in love with the wheel pants on a, on a quote unquote bush plane. I've now had a couple years of flying the Kodiak 900 with the wheel pants, and I have to say, I've, I'm, I'm a believer now. Um, I think there's, there's a time and a place for the Kodiak 100 and the big bush wheels and low pressure tires. Certainly a lot of the places I like to land. This is a little bit of a different market. This can still land on you know, grass and gravel, and we, you know, we took this into a lot of the backcountry strips in Idaho. Really the only thing that the 900 can't do that the 100 can do really well is land on really muddy and soft strips. So the, the Kodiak 100, we certified those 29 inch tires to a, to a really low PSI. So they, you know, they're almost like an Alaskan bush wheel in a lot of ways. They're, you know, a lot of people when they walk up to a Kodiak 100, they say, well, your, your tires are low. Well, no, they're actually designed to be like that. So they float on the surface of really muddy strips or gravel bars, things like that. This airplane's not really designed, if you, if you have that mission, the Kodiak 100 is the airplane for you. This airplane can still, like I said, go into grass, gravel. Um, takeoff performance is still relatively the same. This is, you know, 150 feet more in takeoff, 
It's about 300 feet longer, three to 400 feet longer in landing roll, just because it's a heavier airplane and needs a little bit longer to stop. But, you know, you're still taking off and landing in less than 1,500 feet with an 8,000 pound airplane that's got a 3,000 plus use, useful load. So um, the tires inside of these wheel pants are a smaller tire than the Kodiak 100. So that's why it can't do as well on really muddy strips is because it's a smaller tire, a little bit higher pressure. So it doesn't have quite the surface area, plus it's a heavier airplane. The airplane is approved to fly with or without the wheel pants or wheel fairings. And so, you know, the tires are still gonna be the same. Um, believe it or not, these don't really affect off airport performance that much in terms of like robustness. And I'll show you why. So these are sec what's, cert what's called certified to secondary structure. So you can easily stand on them. They're not gonna give in. Um, you know, there's no placards, don't stand or sit. They're, they're designed to do this. In fact, you know, vertically challenged people like me, I actually stand on them quite often because this is how I check the, uh, the single point refueling. And it's a high pressure system. You can fill the tanks in no time flat. It's really, it's really quite nice. And like I said, it's nice. It's, I can stand on the wheel fairing to get up there. Uh, this airplane sits quite a bit higher, so the next thing I'll talk about is landing gear, but this airplane sits a lot different. So you'll notice we don't have a tail stand on the plane anymore. You really don't need a tail stand with the Kodiak 900 at all. Um, and the reason it sits different is because the landing gear positioning has changed. So again, as I said earlier, when we made the decision that the cargo pod was gonna be an integral part of the plane, we were able to take the landing gear, you can't see it because of the fairing, but in the Kodiak 100, the landing gear goes through the, the bottom floor frame. We took it out of that and moved it down four inches, and so now it actually goes below the bottom floor frame and through the, you know, where the cargo pod covers. And we also, by doing that with the length, we moved the, the landing gear back five inches. And as most people uh, in flight tests know, you know, it's always a balance. The further back you put the gear on the plane, the more force you need for, for takeoff, the less stall performance you have. So landing gear placement is a bit of an art. Um, and so we kind of put it to where we compromised between not needing a tail stand, but still having pretty good takeoff performance and not a lot of um, control forces needed for rotate. But it did make the airplane a bit taller. So the above wing fueling, uh, which you can still do, uh, just as you need a taller ladder. So the single point makes it really convenient. Every airplane's gonna come with one. So it's pretty much the only thing that I use. I mean, unless I go to an airport that doesn't have you know, full service or something like that, where, you know, then I just climb on the wing and fuel it from there. So that's, that's the landing gear. But in terms of the, the rigidity, I mean, the Kodiak 100 has been known for, you know, just how robust the landing gear and the whole airplane is built. This is the same, um, same style landing gear. So it's a two, three inch carry throughs that go all the way through below the belly. You have a big solid steel trunnion right here, and then you have a tapering tube to the gear. So there's no hydraulics, there's no moving pieces. So the landing gear itself is extremely simple, extremely robust. Again, going back to that maintainability, it's it's really easy to um, to service and check. There's no you know really no life limited parts on the gear on this airplane. So moving back to the to the rear door again. <laughs> As we started building this airplane and understanding just how it was gonna be different than the 100, one thing that came to light was by moving the landing gear, the airplane sits almost you know, parallel with the ground now where the Kodiak 100 kind of sat tail low, just that was how it was designed. This sits level with the ground. So even though the airplane, the gear only shifted four inches, the back of the plane moved up quite a bit and the door moved up quite a bit. So our two step, mechanism on the 100 wasn't going to work for this so we had to redesign this rear clamshell style door 
that allowed us to make these steps quite a bit better. So they're all soft closed now and soft open. Of course, the steps themselves are very similar. If anybody's familiar with the TBM, our sister airplane, the, uh, the famous steps on the TBM door, almost identical to this. So we know it's a, it's a great surface and it's non-stick. We also added a bit of a handhold, again, just being higher. Now it's really easy to, to get in. You have something to grab onto when you step in. But we didn't lose, you still have the versatility of the Kodiak 100 door. So both of these attach points, you can easily take out. The door folds flat. If you wanted to, you could you know, have all the seats out. You could still get stretchers or dirt bikes or pallets or whatever you wanted. So you know, the Kodiak 100 was really versatile. The more I fly this, the more I'm starting to realize maybe this is even more versatile because this has so much heritage from the Kodiak 100 but it's still got a lot of heritage from the TBM, from the luxury and a bit more speed. And it's really, I mean, we just, our engineers hit it out of the park. So this project started in earnest in 2016, really. Um, there were some early kind of preliminary discussions in 2015. Um, I've been around long enough that I was, I was in some of those rooms and, you know, speed has always been, you know, everybody wants an airplane that can land and take off vertically fly for 8,000 miles at Mach 1, you know, and only cost $3 million, you know, whatever, right? So everybody wants everything. And as we all know, airplanes are a compromise with what you can do. So the Kodiak 100 was built all around off airport capability, being able to land and take off very short. And the drawback to that type of airplane is you're not always that fast, right? And of course, it's unpressurized as well, so we're in heavier, denser air down at lower altitudes, 10 to 12,000 feet. So we really wanted to, you know, we had always been thinking, how can we make the Kodiak 100 quicker without losing all the other things that make it so great? And what we ultimately decided was, um, we felt like there was room in the market for two Kodiaks. A real hardcore bush plane, you know, in, in lack of a better term, a Jeep Wrangler, something that's really designed to go off airport, used for humanitarian work, put on floats, that kind of thing. And then more of a fa you know, faster airplane that still has heritage, can land off airport, uh, but that can go faster, has a little bit more length, maybe is better suited for fleet operators that want to fill the seat, still have some room in the back for luggage, needed the speed, needed the lower, operating costs. So that's really how the, the Kodiak 900 came to fruition. Um, and then when Dyer purchased the company in 2019, we had, you know, we kind of knew what we were building and Dyer made the call that we really needed to kind of go back to the drawing board and make sure that it was up to the level that they were known for with the TBM. And I think you know, what was gonna be a good product, Dyer said, let's make it a great product. Uh, and that's exactly what they did. So it took a little bit longer to, to get this product out than maybe we had anticipated, but the product that we actually got was substantially better with the Dyer uh, help and of course the engineers and those guys know speed. I mean, I remember there was some flight tests that we were doing with the wheel fairings and when we first put them on, we were quite disappointed because it didn't get us near the speed that we thought it would. And some of the Dyer engineers uh, kind of looked at the data and they said, oh, well, you just need to tweak it a few degrees this way or that way. And then we went out and flew and magically we got like five knots or something. I mean, it was quite substantial. So like I was talking about earlier, that airflow into the engine and outflow, all of that, you know, it was truly a collaboration. We had some brilliant engineers on our side. They have some brilliant engineers in France. And, you know, it was kind of one of those one plus one equals three where our guys and their guys got together pretty quickly after the acquisition. And this airplane exponentially got better uh, through that process. So it's still, you know, and, and the other amazing thing, honestly, that I don't see a lot, I've been in this industry for, uh, you know, over a decade now, we didn't market this airplane before it was certified. Um, 
this was kind of a skunk works project. It was a bit secretive. Uh, and we did that for a lot of reasons, but we didn't want to, we didn't want to taint the market with something that hopes and dreams and wishes and, you know, get everyone's hopes up and then not be able to come to fruition or that it takes a lot longer. And by not having a date that we had announced that, oh, it's going to be flying in 2018, we were able to really tweak it and make it what it needs to be. We, we didn't take orders. We didn't take, and you know, nobody knew about it except us internally. And it really allowed us to, to make the tweaks and, do, and make it the product that we're proud to present. And then we got certified and then at Oshkosh this year is when we presented it on Monday and that's when the order book opened. Uh, so it's been really quite substantial just how many people already have, you know, we, we haven't been flying it really. There's been very few demos that we've done and I, um, you know, we're sold out through next year already. So uh, I think we have a real winner here and I think the more people fly it and the more it gets out there, I think this and the Kodiak 100 um, have a really uh, good spot in the market. So to kind of round out, we talked a lot about exterior. The interior in this airplane, again, uh, really using those die air routes, we were able to use what a lot of people loved on the Kodiak 100, which was a, a good mix between versatility, robustness, but usability and luxury. So we kept all of those type of things, but we also brought in quite a bit more luxury, quite a bit more utility. So the seats are all brand new. You'd notice this is in a double club configuration. The great thing with these seats is you can move them forward facing or aft facing. So they're multi-directional seats. Actually, these will be in the Kodiak 100 as well it adds a lot of um, versatility because now you can do a double club, you can do all forward facing, you can do a club up front and commuter in the back. Um, they have dual armrests, they all recline, they have car style seat belts. And the beauty of these is, you know, you don't need a mechanic to take the seats in and out. And then a few other minor things that we did, you can see just above that orange tape, the amenity panel. This is one of the areas that isn't totally done yet. We're still making some tweaks to this. But for the most part, you'll see what we're trying to get after. It has every seat has a cup holder. There's a plane powered headset jack, so you don't need batteries in your headsets. You have USBs for every single seat. And then there will be eventually be a phone holder as well for every seat. And then another thing that we kept, you know, everybody loves all the different tie downs throughout the cabin because, again, this airplane's used for a plethora of different um, customers. And so there's ample places to, to put tie downs and cargo nets and stuff in the plane. Last two things I'll talk about is electrical and environmental. As I mentioned earlier, electrical was all completely redone. And it wasn't that the Kodiak 100 was bad by any means, it just, there was a lot more new technology that was out and available to us now than there was in 2004 when we started the 100. So everything's auto load shedding. Uh, so if you have any sort of electrical failure, generator, alternator failure, whatever, the electrical system auto load, shed, auto load sheds. So it knows what's least important for you as a pilot to get on the ground safely. And so, um, it kind of does that all for you. The environmental system, being that it's a longer fuselage, heating was gonna be really important. As we all know, pilots usually get baked up front and passengers in the back, especially in a high wing airplane where they're shaded, uh, tend to be a little bit cool. So what we were able to do with this Dash 140A engine is pipe bleed our heat in the entire cabin. It's a little bit hard to see, but on each side, of the airplane, there's a manifold, just like in your car, where it comes out um, at your feet. So bleed air heat, heat comes all the way, you know, to this back baggage shelf now. Uh, we did a ton of testing, obviously being based in Idaho, where it gets really cold in the winter. A lot of testing, I mean, this airplane keeps 70 degrees all the way to 25,000 feet in the winter. It's really substantial. You could even have, you know, the environmentals work to where you could even have AC running. It's a dual zone. So the pilots are one zone and then the passengers are another zone. 
So if you had a weird scenario where you had really cold passengers, but really hot pilots, pilots could have AC, passengers could have heat, you know, so it's, again, it's uh, really, really quite comfortable from, from those regards. The AC works extremely well as well for the whole cabin. And then the other thing that we did is this airplane with the five blade prop, it's a bit quieter. Some other tweaks that we did on the interior, this airplane is really quiet inside as well. So, you know, there's a lot of customers that are fleet operators maybe where they don't want to give headsets to every passenger in the back. And um, it's, it's, it's not a pressurized airplane. I mean, it's not going to be as quiet as a pressurized jet by any means, but for what it is unpressurized, uh, you can easily have a conversation in the back without headsets in flight. So avionics are G1000 NXI. A little bit of changes up front again, and part of the electrical changes, we made some tweaks there. Uh, every, every airplane comes standard with the three screen, PFD1, MFD, PFD2. Uh, we made some ergonomic changes, again, this being special missions related. We opened up a lot of panel space for our special missions operators to be able to put different radios and things that they might need. Uh, so we made those changes and then um, we also added a few features like 3D audio, wire aware, which is prevalent in helicopters, but this airplane flies low where a lot of helicopters sometimes fly. And so we thought wire aware would be a good safety benefit for our customers. Of course, you still have the GFC 700 autopilot with full coupled approaches, ESP, level mode, all the safety features that the Kodiak 100 has been known for.